Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 22nd, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Diary today from Xavier talking about a PowerShell script that he ran into that, well, will load the R evil ransomware, but it does so using a PowerShell script feature called run spaces, which isn't often seen in malware and apparently here used to evade some of the te detection techniques. And also this particular script had a very low virus total score. Run spaces are, well, sort of containers, I guess you could call them, that uh, isolate different uh, PowerShell uh, threats from each other. They all run in the same PowerShell process, which uh, makes it a little bit more efficient than having uh, multiple PowerShell processes running instead. In this case, it also helps with obfuscating the code. Uh, one of the run spaces is then decrypting additional code using a key that is passed to it as a variable. This uh, diary also comes with a warning from Xavier. Xavier analyzed uh, this piece of malware in his lab, which uh, is isolated from the rest of the network. And uh, this uh, turned out to be quite useful in this case, because as he was analyzing the malware as typical when you're doing runtime analysis, he set a couple of breakpoints uh, to figure out how uh, the malware operates, but well, forgot one and actually his lab machine ended up encrypted by the ransomware. Not a big deal for a lab machine, of course. Well, uh, now you have to recover it, uh, but I have seen this uh, go wrong uh, quite often before where analysts weren't careful enough and losing real work or even leaking data by running malicious code on a regular work machine. And researchers at Onapsis found posted on GitHub a functional exploit that takes advantage of a vulnerability in SAP's Solution Manager. Now, this vulnerability was patched early in 2020. And well, it had a CVSS score of 10, meaning that successful exploitation can lead to a complete system compromise. In particular here, uh, they're dealing with a missing authentication check, so arbitrary code can be executed. So make sure that CVE 2020-6207 is patched. And what makes that probably worse is that the vulnerable component, the SAP Solution Manager, is essentially sort of the management system they're using uh, to uh, manage all of your SAP components. So compromising the system pretty much puts everything that you're sort of running inside SAP at risk. And talking about these large business systems, Oracle also released its quarterly critical patch update. This one is the January 2021 edition. And yeah, it fixes uh, 329 vulnerabilities. So really uh, too much uh, to talk about them all. The one uh, component I'm always sort of looking for is WebLogic because we have seen a lot of exploits against that in the past. And Oracle actually points out that uh, in November, November 1st, they published an out of band uh, update for WebLogic. Uh, this uh, new update here also uh, patches uh, six different vulnerabilities in WebLogic, all with a score of 9.8. And need yet another reason to not expose RDP servers uh, to the public internet. According to NetScout, exposed RDP servers are now used as amplifiers for reflective denial of service attacks. This only works if uh, the RDP service does support UDP. You may turn that off and the amplification factor reached here is about 86. Okay, it's Friday again, and uh, with me today I have another sans.edu student, uh, Billy Wilson. Billy Wilson has actually been on the podcast before, uh, but uh, Billy, could you please introduce yourself again? Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, as you said, I'm Billy Wilson. I'm a high-performance computing systems administrator at Brigham Young University, 
I've been there for six years now, and I recently graduated from SANS Technology Institute with a master's degree. So last time uh, you talked about your first research uh, paper, uh, you talked about you know, how to monitor uh, some of these uh, high performance computing environments where you really sort of you know, want to save uh, CPU cycles and can't just throw some heavy monitoring equipment uh, on uh, the system. Can you explain what you did this time uh, with your research, with your second and, uh, well, last research paper? Yes. So for my last research paper, Last time, it was pure monitoring. I was logging malicious activity on the supercomputer. But this time, it's logging and mitigation. And the way we did this was by using a brand new Linux security module that came out last year called KRSI, which stands for Kernel Runtime Security Instrumentation. You're already familiar with SE Linux, and AppArmor, these existing uh, Linux security modules that provide a form of mandatory access control. And you can customize those pretty well with like a, a type enforcement policy or profiles, but you do have limitations within the framework that they provide. And unfortunately, those do have some performance costs to enabling something like SE Linux, where it's, it's not often that you see SE Linux enabled on the compute cluster itself in a high performance computing environment. So this, this new approach with this new LSM was an attempt to get mandatory access control, kind of customize it to avoid performance impact and still get some, some big benefits on the cluster itself. So uh, one common reason I see SE Linux uh, being disabled is not because of its performance, but uh, because it's just a pain to administer. Let's admit it. Kind of you can if you turn it on, as long as one of the default configurations work for you, it's all good. But then as soon as something is a little bit configured differently, you're moving uh, directories around and such, uh, it typically blocks stuff. And so the quick fix is let's just turn it off. Uh, the, this new uh, module, is this a little bit easier to configure? Or I imagine particular in your environment, you have to customize that quite a bit, Dor. Yeah, so I wish I had good news to say this is the easy way to do it, but it's definitely still not. To use it, you do have to have some programming experience instead of just changing a config file. So you're you're writing programs that that are examining the kernel at this point. You're looking at different kernel structures to see behavior you don't like. The benefit is that you write a very small specific program so that you're only looking at what you want to look at instead of enabling this big monolithic thing that has all these these different things it might be doing, right? Yeah, and uh, with SE Linux, I also found the documentation sometimes a little bit lacking uh, that has, I think, gotten better in the last couple of years as you know more people sort of really uh, contributed uh, to the documentation and wrote blogs and such about how to configure it. Uh, this being a pretty new uh, kernel module, how found? How did you find a co the documentation? Did it work for you? Did you find of some practical examples that you could uh, leverage? Yeah, and that's actually why I did the research is I saw these patch sets of this new Linux security module on the kernel mailing list. I was excited. And then I tried using their examples and they didn't work. And I thought, I must just not be smart enough not doing this. But as I looked into it, it turns out that those patch sets were modified before they actually made it into the mainline kernel so that the original examples that I was trying didn't work anymore on the kernel. So I put some work into making new examples in my research that actually work in the mainline kernel that do cool things like monitoring file system uh, events or, or processes or, or signals or network events so that you could actually look at this and, and try it out. I will say it's still not for the faint hearted still because you're sort of in the plumbing because it's just so new. I do think that in the next year or two, you're start, you will start seeing more tools support it, specifically one called DPF Trace has a pull request right now on their GitHub to support KRSI type work. And that'll make it a lot more approachable for everybody. Yeah, and not being smart enough, uh, that excuse no longer counts since you graduated now, but uh, <laughs> regardless of that. Uh, so, you know, one of your concerns, of course, is performance. 
Uh, did you find any advantage uh, in it, as far as performance goes between SE Linux and uh, KSRI uh, you know, doing the same thing? Uh, you know what? I did see some benefits to using this, this new one, KRSI. I tried to break it, essentially, by stress testing it this way and that way. First, there was a computational approach trying to put some heavy CPU cycles on the system while KRSI was monitoring some things. Second was some heavy like file system operations with metadata making tons and tons of files because that's really common for scientific software. And then another one was heavy, heavy network traffic, creating a lot of TCP connections. And seeing what at, at what point, seeing at what point when I push the system hard will it start to degrade performance. And I found that as long as the system's being pushed to a limit where where the operating system can handle it, you don't see KRSI hurting performance. But as soon as I start pushing a system so hard that the operating system itself is suffering, I can see signs that KRSI is causing additional performance loss. So as long as you're mostly a good citizen and you're not causing the operating system to suffer, you can probably customize these KRSI programs to monitor in cool ways without hurting performance. Okay, and uh, what about the granularity? Anything you were able to do with uh, KRSI that you couldn't do with SE Linux? That's where it gets real fun and creative. And I, I hope some people get excited when they see a couple of these examples. Uh, the ones that I am thinking of off the top of my head, one involved signals. I was able to write a program that attached to this LSM hook responsible for for monitoring signals sent by processes or or the kernel even. And it was able to protect certain processes from kill and termination signals, making them essentially unkillable for critical processes. So that was that was interesting. It was also able to um, I wrote some other programs that were able to monitor file system events and permissions so that when users create new files or modify permissions on an existing file, if there were certain criteria that I didn't like, it would prevent that change before it happened. So interesting. And actually putting my you know, darker hat uh, on here, uh, that may actually also be nice for a rootkit or such or to uh, prevent it from being killed. Uh, could this be used maliciously that way? I think so. Someone that gets comfortable with it, they could use it in interesting ways that that serve the the attacker or or the uh, malicious script, right? Yeah. Uh, so cool. Uh, so a uh, link uh, to the paper with all these examples and such, of course, will be in the show notes. Uh, but uh, what's next for you now? Since you're done, you must have a lot of spare time on your hand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I do have a lot of spare time, and having put a lot of time into the program. I do think it's time for me to stop looking inward for growing my own career and start looking outward. So I'm hoping to to give back to the community more, the security community. I, I love the community. I'm, I'm grateful for all the collaboration and the experiences I've had with other professionals and also just, you know, the local community to contribute some more time there. Okay, excellent. And uh, thanks for joining us here. And thanks everybody for listening. And well, Talk to you again on Monday. Bye.